Alrighty. I guess we'll make a start. So, Erling and Sons, failing with concurrency better than you since 1986. It's a more positive talk than it sounds like. It's a pun. Hopefully it will make sense later. So, let's uh, turn on the click slide clicker for bonus features, like it working. So, uh, agenda thingy. Um, very brief little history bit, because you should always start the narrative, apparently. Um, a sort of overview of um, Erlang in terms of, you know, what are the key facets, if you will, of this sort of solution to the problem uh, that the chaps were facing. Then we're going to obviously focus in on a couple of the details which we believe to be interesting ones. Uh, then we're going to talk about the mm, sun's part of it, uh, specifically Elixir. And then perhaps uh, finishing up with the hopefully interesting question of should you use it? And we'll see what time we've got left. Um, okay. So, Wentz Erlang, where does this come from? Um, well, it was created in, at Ericsson in 1986. Uh, so, fair little way back. Um, fortunately, we don't have to use our imagination to picture the kind of uh, uh, individuals who came up with this since they helpfully made a video of themselves. Hello, my name is John Edgar and I'm responsible for the Computer Science Laboratory. Our job is to put research to work. So that's one of them. Their job was to put research to work. So they had a, uh, a rather specific um, uh, industry kind of goal they were trying to meet. And unsurprisingly, it was to do with telecoms. Um, so Erlang was created as a platform for telephone okay, switches. We have programmed an er Ericsson MD110 PABX, this PABX you see here, using Erlang. So not too awkward then. So uh, <laughs> Erlang. Um, so, uh, like I say, there's a rich theme of hilarity in this video, which is actually done sort of in full seriousness by these chaps uh, at the time. So it might seem a bit of an odd place for it to come from, but when, they, when you think about it, Unix and C both came um, about from telecoms as well, um, uh, trying to program telephone switches. It's quite a niche problem they had, really, if you think about it. This is so mid-80s, you think about what your computers were like at the time, um, if they were being connected to anything at all, um, and yet the problem these people had was they had to deal with thousands of concurrent connections, um, both in and out, so in this case telephone calls. Um, it had to be soft real time, it had to respond to the, the touch tones that people were putting in uh, and deal with those things. It wasn't like a batch processing system that would run overnight, um, like other kind of computing problems of the day. Uh, it had to be fault tolerant, um, software or hardware faults, um, it should be as contained as possible. Obviously, if the whole switch dies, there's not a lot you can do about that. But if there's a problem, uh, be it, a, it might be a, a bug in the software or it might be something unexpected happens with an individual call, then that should be as contained as possible. Everyone shouldn't have their call drop. Um, so uh, everything should recover. Uh, once again, the guys are there for us. Hello, Mike. Hello, Joe. System working? Seems to be. Okay, fine. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> checking it's all, uh, everything's in place. Steve and Joe, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything all right? Yeah. So, uh, it also, they had a desire to, it needs to be upgradable with zero downtime, because if you think about it, the hardware's very expensive, it might be somewhere remote, uh, the switches are sort of spread about, you can't necessarily have two of everything in place, so you can do some kind of, um, uh, load balanced kind of failover. Well, that's going to get annoying, isn't it? That was slack, I think. Oh well. Um, see if it happens again. Um, so they wanted to be upgradable with zero downtime, a single instance uh, of the system, and they needed to be able to run on sort of heterogeneous environment. You know, they didn't know what kind of hardware they were going to run on in the future. So that was quite a niche problem, sort of in the mid '80s. But when you think about it, it's not really such a niche. Uh, situation now, which is why we're kind of why I'm interested in this, or one of the reasons, and why I think it's an interesting topic, is those um, uh, facets of the problem are actually a lot more common these days. Particularly, um, the, the the number of concurrent connections becomes particularly um, important when you think of things where there's a there's a connection held open, so stuff using web sockets and that kind of thing, um, and. Um, as we say, you know, fault tolerance, people's expectations, you know, it's, it's quite unusual now where you see, do you remember those things you'd see on web pages that say, this site is closed for maintenance between the hours of nine and 12, you know, so obviously these things are all uh, increasingly important. So we think this, this, uh, 
has got a, a more relevance today than it did have when it was actually created. Uh, so as a result of that, um, here's a list of people who use Erlang in a number of different things. So obviously telecoms and messaging still uh, still got a good foothold there. Unsurprisingly, Ericsson use it, although they did go through a period where they banned their own uh, technology when they had a bit of a political struggle at the top, but they're all they're on board with it again. T-Mobile use it for all the text messaging. Uh, Motorola use it again for call handling. And also widening that net slightly, um, Facebook Messenger uh, is written in Erlang and WhatsApp. <laughs> Much to the rejoicing and joy of the Erlang community as they now have a poster child. Uh, ten developers at WhatsApp um, basically managing the whole thing. Uh, databases and infrastructure. I don't know if I should mention Couchbase is a positive thing. We've had a bit of a sour experience just of late, but generally speaking, considered to be quite reliable. Uh, it's probably the C++ bit that went wrong in our case, I'm sure, because it's a mixture. Because uh, CouchDB was Erlang, and they mixed it with Membase. So there's a bit of C++ in there. React, uh, Key Value Store, uh, AWS, SimpleDB, uh, RabbitMQ, and some miscellaneous companies. Obviously, these aren't using it for their whole everything, but they're using it uh, in parts of it. We've got Goldman Sachs, Bet365, Call of Duty, League of Legends, AOL. So what was the solution that they came up with broadly? We've, we've outlined the, the sort of shape of the problem. Well, it's a managed system, so that helps them with the heterogeneous environment. So it compiles to like a byte code. We'll, we'll touch on this in a minute. Uh, it's functional language, which is uh, it's interesting. Uh, it uses the actor model. Um, and it has a prologue-esque syntax. So these are the four kind of... This this is essentially the outline of the, the bulk of the rest of what we're going to talk about. We're just going to touch on each of these and kind of uh, have a look at what that kind of means in practice and then like I say we've got some stuff to, to wrap up at the end. so it's managed language so it compiles into a, a form of bytecode much like .NET or Java although unlike those it runs in quite a specialised VM so the, say for example the JVM is designed to be quite um, <laughs> low level, quite generic you can build different languages on top of it with quite different semantics um, the Erlang VM is, is quite optimized. I'm looking through an interesting um, uh, presentation recently, and they were showing just sort of some of the different differences of how, like, say, the JVM lays out its memory compared to the Erlang VM, and it's massively different. Um, and that uh, sort of is because the, 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 um, the unique sort of uh, characteristics they were trying to get to from this language, they've kind of baked them into the VM. Um, and the runtime uh, supports quite a lot of um, uh, powerful sort of interactions, certainly for the day when they do that demo. It's actually quite a good demo they do when you stop laughing on that video. And still quite good now that you can connect to a running system um, and you can see exactly what's going on. You can turn on tracing. You can see messaging going between various pieces. Uh, you can send messages to parts of the system. Uh, and you can even hot reload the code while it's running. There's an excellent demo, which I should have put a little uh, video link in for. Um, where the quadricopter, which is running Erlang code, and there's deliberately a bug in it, and it's dipping and sort of bobbing in front of the table, and the guy hits a key and patches it while it's in flight, and it suddenly stabilizes. Um, so you can have a loop that's been running for 10 years, and then you can update it on like the 50 millionth iteration, it starts running a slightly different version of the code. Um, and their Erlang systems have been running since like the mid-90s, um, so that's a fairly realistic situation. Um, it's a functional language. We'll spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, we're not going to do it's not going to be a sort of full introduction to functional programming. I know um, um, Andy, Andy has uh, done a bunch of stuff. Uh, James Kirk's done a bunch of stuff. And I'm sure you've looked at it yourself. We're just going to touch on a couple of examples. So functional is it's quite a sort of woolly definition. So, but what I've tried to do is pick out a few of the sort of key things which are considered to make a language functional and just sort of show a little bit of um, how that works uh, in Erlang. Now we're not going to use Erlang syntax, we're going to come on to that in a minute, so we're going to use kind of like a pseudo code. Um, but what you can do is, is the same. Uh, and we'll, we'll loop back to that point at the end, because all is not lost. So I think pretty much first part of the definition of a functional language is you've got first class functions. So you can have a function and you can pass it into another function like a value. So in this example, we've got a list. Yeah, laser pointers work awesome on screens. Uh, with two things in it, hello world. We pipe that into a map function and the other parameter that goes into this map function is a function, like a lambda function. So we've got the word goes in and it runs string uppercase word. 
So it runs that on everything, so you'd end up with capital hello world. You didn't pass a function in. You can return functions um, from other functions. So in this case, I've, I've stuck to kind of the, the classic examples. We've got a function here. It's just an anonymous function I've assigned to something, a bit like in JavaScript. Um, so we've called it amount to add. And it returns a function, which accepts a number. Uh, sorry, it's called adder. It accepts a, a variable called amount to add, and it returns a function for you, which itself takes a number and adds it to what you gave. So what would you do with that? You'd call adder, giving it five. You've now got a function called add five. If you call add five, you get nine, and hey, let's do the same thing again. You can pass it into a map, and it'll run it over. So you can pass functions around as values. Another thing which is often... Um, uh, touted as a feature of functional languages, they tend to emphasize immutability to varying degrees. Uh, and that's true of the um, of Erlang. It's got quite tight immutability guarantees, uh, which becomes quite relevant when we're thinking about concurrency. So for example, again, we have a list here, one, two, three, my list. We can pass it into something which messes about with it. We might get a change list out the other side, but our original one is guaranteed to be untouched. Um, and because of that, there's all kinds of optimizations that the, uh, the VM can make. Sure. If, if you're familiar with the way you know way a linked list works, obviously you can pop an element off a list by just taking the pointer to the tail of the list, and you get a new list without actually having to copy anything, and you haven't mutated the original. So once you've got data, it can't be changed. It's always transformation. You have the data comes in, you have some function which returns a new copy uh, of the data. Although I say often without any copy, which is quite clever. Optimized tail recursion. So as a sort of side effect of the immutability, generally speaking, in a functional language, you can't just have a loop with like a sort of four i in i less than 10 because you can't really change i. So what you tend to do is you have a function which does some stuff and then it calls itself maybe with, maybe does something to the first part of a list if it's like a map, and then it calls itself again with the remainder of the list. So kind of looking like this, we've got function, keep on keeping on, and what does it do? Hello, and then it calls keep on keeping on. Now in languages without tail call optimization, you're going to use up the stack pretty damn quick because, you know, you're just going to have a massive stack trace of uh, the same function over and over again. But functional languages, providing the last thing you do is call yourself, they uh, do some clever little trick to kind of skip that being a problem. What's the point of that? Well, I'll leave that in the words of XKCD. I find that funny. Maybe that says more about me. Um, but yeah, it gives us a way to kind of, of loop over things. And we'll see this technique come up again in a minute. So we've got first class functions, pass them around. Um, we've got immutable data. We've got tail call recursion. So another uh, feature that you get in many functional languages, not exclusively functional languages, I believe there's plans afoot for C sharp to steal it from F sharp, like many other good things, which I'm all in favor of, is pattern matching. Now, you may have heard many mysterious things about the power of pattern matching, so prepare to have your minds blown. Behold the pattern matching, n equals 1. So in its simplest form, essentially, it's a bit like assignment. We've got something on the right, and if this was in another language, we'd say, hey, we've assigned it to n. But functional people who are being a bit anal about it might say, no, 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 no. we've bound the variable and so forth. You might say, what's the difference? Or bound the uh, identifier or something. Well, crucially, the way to look at this is uh, it's, it's a bit more like an equation. Uh, so, you know, when you're first sort of doing a bit of maths, you always think of, you know, equals means answer. And then when you get into a little bit further on, you oh, I can actually start rearranging things here. It's not just answer, it's saying these two things are the same. Um, so in the simple form, well, how do we make uh, n equal to 1? Well, we'll set n to 1. So that's what happens. It acts like an assignment. Likewise, some with uh, something with structure to it. Imagine that's a tuple. Um, in our little uh, pseudocode. So t equals 1, 2. And again, straight assignment. But it starts getting a bit more interesting because you can start to sort of destructure the data. And this is where we're starting to get a little bit of power. So, okay, how do we make first number, which is a variable, and ignore the second thing, equal to 1 and 2? Well, first number will be assigned to 1. So we've taken a tuple and we've managed to pull out the first thing and assign it to a variable. So we've kind of destructured the data. Okay, start to see some uses of this. But then also, this is this is where pattern matching gets a little bit more interesting. Is it's not just a what it'll do is it'll look at the two sides. Can I make this equal? If it can, it does it. Hey, we got some assignment. We maybe pick something out of the data. But it's also a question: Can I make this an assignment? 
So we've got a tuple on the right, string error and a number, 404. On the left, you'll notice the second element here is a variable, so 404 will become here, but only <coughs> if this element is error. If this says success, this won't fly. You can't match this to this. You'll get an exception <laughs> if you're just doing it as a, just a line of code on its own because it fails. It's a bit like a regex if you think about it. A regex has kind of got two properties to it. Is there's a, did you match? And if so, can you give me the pieces, please? It's kind of a, a match and extract together. So that, that'll work. Like I say, if you just had that as a line of code, it's floating on its own, it'll pop. It'll throw an exception if it, if it can't be matched. Nothing I can do about it. Uh, so just carrying on with the same example. So here's our, 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 error, our tuple of error and 404. But if you use a pattern match in a scenario where there's a couple of options, you can use it as a conditional. So here we've got if you can make t equal to error thing, then go into here. And we can use this variable. So we've got a check and an extract. If you can make uh, this tuple match this one, then go for it and bind the variables in it and we can use them. Hey, but if not, no worries, we've got an else for that. So a pattern match, it's both an assignment, a destructure, and a test. So it's, like I say, it's most like a regex, which kind of makes sense because that's got the word match in too, so we're all good. And you can get even more interesting than that, so that outputs, oh dear. In many languages which support pattern matching as well, you can use it not just for if you've got an if, but you can also have multiple versions of a function with requirements on them. You know, they've got uh, restrictions, as it were. And at runtime, it'll pick the right version of the function. A bit like if you're used to using a static language like C Sharp, you can have overloads of a function, right? If it's an int, use this one. If it's a double, use this one. In language with pattern matching, you can often do this. Uh, here's our tuple again, error of t, and we've got two copies of log result. The first one has a tuple in it, and it will try and, if you call this log result, it will try, can I match this? You know, if the first element's an error, cool, we can use this version of the function, it'll fill in this variable for us. Same thing. If it's not, then it will fall through and use this one because this one goes with anything. So it's a bit like that if, and you can have something very similar to a switch statement as well. So there's various constructs which use this. So you've got a pattern match going on here. It'll pick the right function for the for the data you've given it. It's worth having a play with. It's pretty cool. So if you call log result with our, our friendly T, you'll get, oh dear, 404. You call log result with, say, OK, 200, you'll get all as well. And so what you end up with when you actually start structuring code like that is you end up with a bunch of definitions of functions which kind of read a bit like the various kind of cases of a test statement. If we come in and it's an error, do this. If you come in and it's like this, then do this. And you're just sort of defining the scenarios essentially. Um, so you can get some quite, once you've got your eye in and you, got, you can sort of see what it's doing, you can get some quite elegant code. You tend to have very short functions um, as a result. I mean, you could argue it's, you know, it's just kind of a glorified bit of syntax over under the hood, it's all lifts, you could say, but it does actually read quite nicely once you've got your eye in. So that's pattern matching. Now, up to now, we've talked about um, some functional stuff and we've talked about managed stuff. That's quite common in other languages. Uh, the actor model is a little bit more specialist. Um, I think it's fair to say Erlang, uh, the Erlang VM is the only virtual machine, the only sort of language which is designed around the actor model as a pattern. There are other uh, languages which implement uh, sort of an actor model sort of framework, but it's done at a language level. Uh, and we'll, we'll see some of the differences in that later. For example, Scala is quite successful. You've got the Acker um, framework and on C Sharp, you've got Acker.net and also Project uh, Orleans uh, is quite an interesting one as well. But as we say, it's baked right in down at the deepest level, which makes it quite cool. So what is the actor model? Um, well, it's actually it's it's a it's a model which comes sort of from AI research, like actually much of the early uh, um, programming language development. And the ideas actually come from before Erlang was implemented. The guys who were implemented weren't actually aware of it at the time. There's only sort of afterwards they thought, oh, you know, we've struck on a good idea that somebody else has had. And it's just sort of modelled after the way neurons work, in the sense that well, let's have a bunch of things which do something simple and they'll communicate with each other. And so the idea is that you have isolated, lightweight actors, or processes is the terminology that Erlang tends to use. So what do we mean by that? Well, they, the processes, they, they, they're individually quite simple. They run sequential code, one operation after another, much like just a single-threaded process in a, in, in a regular system. We said they're isolated. 
they share nothing. They're not in the same memory space. They can't read and write each other's variables. They can't touch each other, much like uh, processes in a, in, a, in a regular system. They're very small. At least that's the theory. And in Erlang, um, that is true. So, let's pop up a console. Let's make it bigger. That's still quite small text, isn't it? Oh, what a guess. That's the button. Right. I'm going to load some code. So I'm just popping up an Erlang shell. And I'm going to spawn some processes. Let's make a hundred thousand. Yeah. So there's a hundred thousand processes. Just summarize the list for us. That took uh, 665 milliseconds for our hundred thousand processes. They're all still there. They're still running. Pick a number up to a hundred thousand. Let's have a chat with one of them. Four. <laughs> we can do four. So we've got a list, incidentally. Uh, I can't see my command. Prox. So the 100,000 process, the, the kind of tags, the identifies, the handles, if you will, to them, is stored in this list. So number four, right? So What are those processes? They're just completely empty processes. They're, they're, we'll get onto that in a minute, but what these ones are all doing is they're all sit listening to their mailbox, waiting for a message. Uh, and we're going to send them a message. So, um, four. So, we've got ourselves a list of processes. Pipe it into enum app. Four. Let's get the fourth one. Pipe that into the send command, and we're going to send the send it a message. The message in this case is just a symbol, hello. Hello from, and it's given us its identifier, which it knows. And since we've gone for a low number, we should be able to confirm that Oh, I picked the fifth one, didn't I? Yeah, there it is, because I put four. So, and like I say, let's 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 be a bit interesting. Let's go for uh, one. Let's talk to Mister Forty Four Thousand. You don't need it. It's um, it's optional. That's just uh, yeah. So, actually, that's interesting. Little side point: the, that one's actually exited because I made it just listen on its mailbox once. So when we try to speak to the same one again. We didn't get a hello from, because that, that one's uh, finished its job and terminated. But there we go. We, so we spawned 100,000 little processes, okay? So they're all in their own little memory space. By comparison, 100,000 threads, which are in a shared memory space, would use up 100 gigabytes of uh, Windows memory. So if you're looking for something, a construct to organize uh, concurrency around, threads might be one way you did it. That's what, for example, the Outlook team did. You know, they've designed a system where they've used concurrency available and they've created threads but the OS doesn't really like that and when you try and use Outlook a hundred thousand or not hundred thousand hundreds of threads doesn't sit so well because the OS is having trouble swapping them all in and out they're quite big uh, but these are these are different so these aren't your grandfather's processes but they have some of the benefits they're shit they've got their own little uh, memory space they, they won't trample over each other so what are the advantages although it's a bit different it's also kind of familiar isn't it because it's how services communicate. If you've got your, your service-oriented architecture, or if you're really hip and with it, you might have microservices. Um, and they're sending each other messages. They're not reading each other's memory. They're sending messages to each other to do stuff. It's how people collaborate, you know, sort of more fundamentally, making requests of each other, not climbing in each other's brains and pulling things out. And it's, it's a bit like that CRC session we do, you know, with the, the checkout thing. There's the big reveal at the end where, but what if we used messages? And we pass bits of paper around amongst each other. It's, it's essentially a bit like that. Um, like we said, it's share nothing. Um, so that's, that's good. It's simpler for a developer to reason about. You're, you're, if you're reading a piece of code and you've got variables in it, well, not variables, whatever the fancy word for non-variable variables is, values, Nobody else is changing them. There's no other bit of code going to preempt you. Like in a thread, you have to worry about what if between this line and this line, somebody comes in and changes something. Or even in Node, where it's um, collaborative uh, multitasking, where you essentially yield to the, the uh, sort of context switch. Still, you've got places where values can change. When you're writing code in an actor, you change your values, nobody else. It's kind of simplistic. You get to write nice, good, old-fashioned sequential code again. It's also simpler for the runtime. Um, the, uh, for example, because the runtime knows this value, only this can see it, if that process is dead, they're all freed immediately. If that process has used up its bit of space, we need to do a bit of garbage collection. It's got a small little space of memory allocated to it, and it can do quite a simplistic job. So the garbage collection 
is not a global stop the world like it is on, say, JVM or other systems. It happens on a per process basis. And actually, a lot of short lived processes never actually get to needing a first round of garbage collection because they're created, they do their thing that in their initial allocated pool of memory and they go away. I think it's about two and a half K they get for starters, incidentally. Um, so garbage collection is very small and it's localized. You don't get those kind of big jumps in performance. It's easier to distribute across machines. If you think about it, you've got chunks of functionality and they're talking by sending messages with no sort of shared variables and memory. Essentially, it's a, it's a serialization thing and the runtime handles that for you. You send a message you know, of a, an array or a tuple with hello 53, you know, that will kind of get serialized as a binary thing and copied into that other process's space. So should you want to actually run that piece of code on another box, it's a very simple change in code um, because you've not got to, uh, you know, you've got to think about serialization. Oh, damn it, you know, this thing was reading this thing before it, now it can't. Um, although, warning, it's not magic. Sun's uh, <laughs> 10 fallacies of distributed computing still apply. The fact that the language does a bunch of work for you doesn't mean you don't actually have to think about it. And I debate it if you see it written anywhere that it makes it transparent what box something's on because you know latency and things so you still actually need to think about it but code wise you just say run that on a different box and it will so we can see there's some advantages to that so how, how does that actually work how do we make use of these um these actors we'll look at a couple of uh, patterns and something called otp so um paul asked well what are they actually doing how do you you know, what are these processes doing? Here's an example of spawning a process. So we got a couple of numbers. We call the built-in function spawn and we give it a little lambda function here, nothing in, and uh, add up these A and B and suddenly these values get copied in. Um, this thing will run and tell nobody what it did. It's not very exciting. So it's probably a good idea if we have our process communicate. So we've, uh, as we said, processes, they run sequential code and they can send messages. So in this case, before we start the process, we've kind of got a reference to, you know, if you call self, it gives you your kind of handle to the current process. Um, and then we spawn off our little anonymous function as a, as a, um, a process. And we use the other built-in thing, we use send. We say, I want you to send a message from yourself to this process with the answer A and B. So, so what, now, go for it. So what's in your new process? In our process is essentially, it's got a function to run and it's got copies of three things. It's got the values of A, uh, of a and B, and it's got the reference to, uh, it's basically got these, these, it's a bit like a closure. This has captured these three values when it started. So it's got copies of those when it runs, and it runs this function. All that function does is add up A and B, and use the built-in function send to send a message to the process that created it. And is it now available for reuse? The process, that particular process is going to exit. We're going to come on to that. It's a good question. This one will do that, and it's gone. Um, but if we're going to send a message, it's kind of useful if we can receive it as well. So same thing again. I've just shuffled it up. Here we go. We've spawned off this little function, which sends a message to daddy and dies. And then we've got a, we call receive, which is a, a blocking function, which will wait until it gets uh, a message. So this is how we look in our ma mailbox. We say, so we're back in our process now, and we say, um, I want to wait for a message. And we've got a little bit of pattern matching here. Well, it's, it can be pattern matching. In this case, we've just got one clause. Uh, when a message comes in, just print it out. The answer was, and in this case, the message was just the, the answer. We told this this process sent a message to its daddy with just a number in. So the number nine. When the message comes in, the answer was nine. And also, just, just to demonstrate the point, you can have timeouts as well. So after 10 seconds, or probably 10 milliseconds, actually, so it's how uh, I give up. So it's the receive that does the blocking rather than spawn up the process, so it's an asynchronous Yes, exactly. This is just, just happens. There are ways to do it in a more blocking way, but we'll cover that later. So this is just right, make me a process and then wait for a message. You know, if something's gone wrong or it just takes a long time, this in this case, I've just I put a time out just to demonstrate you can do that. So, okay, that's... Does, yep. uh, does the message sit in the inbox until something yes. takes it out? So yes. obviously there you're spawning up the process and then you're writing the receiving bit. Yep, yep, yep. It doesn't matter which order. Well, it does matter. You kind of, yeah. So this will start looking in the mailbox. If it's not there at this point, it'll sit and wait until it is. If it's already there, it's already there and this will kind of go straight in here. Now to, to Claire's point, you know, she was saying, is it still there? Is it available? In this case, it isn't. So probably realistically, we're going to want something that sits there deals with incoming messages, does something about it. 
So we use our good friend recursion. So here we've got ourselves a function, do loop. Uh, and if we use this as the basis for a process, what would it do? I've, I've imagined there's some helper functions off here. Just wait for a message. That'll block. Ah, I got a message. Do something with a message, which could include sending messages to people that, you know, uh, might be mentioned in that message or people I know about. I might dispatch off my own processes to do some helper stuff. Uh, and when I'm finished with that, call yourself, do loop. So it goes in, wait for a message, deal with the message, potentially send some other things, and again, and again, and again. So if you make a process, if you start off, spawn off a process, and you give it this function to do its work, uh, off it trots, processing its mailbox forever, until it has a problem. Uh, which is pretty cool, actually. We can extend that just slightly. So if you look here, it just receives a message, processes it, and does a loop. Um, but this pattern, actually, with a slight extension, solves an interesting little problem of functional programming. So in functional programming, it's all about don't change anything, no side effects in pure, pure functional programming. So that's cool if you don't actually want to achieve a lot. Or if you've got a kind of batch process where you've got maybe a text file comes in, we do some stuff, at the very end of it, it returns an answer. But if you've got a server that you want running, there's a chance you might actually want some state. So generally speaking, different functional languages have different ways of kind of working around that and kind of having some way of managing state. But if we sacrifice the sort of functional purity in this one place, or two places, of being able to have a mailbox, so a function will just act on its inputs, plus what's in the mailbox. And the only side effect it's allowed to have is sending messages. So we've, we've, we've made a pragmatic break in the rules, but it's two quite well thought out incisions, I think. So functions, you call a function, it will do the same thing given the inputs, plus kind of need to cheat a bit if we're going to have it running forever and responding to people. It can read its mailbox and it can send messages. They're the two incisions into the kind of pure functionality of it. So slight variation on our do loop. It takes some value, the current state, if you will, of this recursive server. Waits for a message, same, it's got a message. It, it calls it do something with my message function. It passes the message plus whatever our current state is from last time. We've got some new state. It then calls do loop and gives itself a new state. That means that our process message function, if it wants, as a result of reading this message, could could change something about itself. So say it's let's say this process is called light bulb and the word state is off. Okay? Then it receives a message, it waits for a message for ages, receives a message saying turn on. Inside process message it says right I'll turn on and it returns a new state of on. And then we recurse, do loop. Now it comes in sitting here waiting for the next message and the value of this is on. So we've not stored any state anywhere. The only state is being passed in recursively down, but it gives us a, an interesting way to combine a message plus what happened last time, call the next one. It occurs to me, this is very, if you think about the shape of this function, if you were to write it, it's actually very similar to a, a, um, a reduce function if you're doing JavaScript or aggregate if you're doing C sharp, where you have a collection of stuff ahead of time before you start usually, and you say reduce and you, you, get, you write a little function that does the work. And what does it take? It takes the current item in the list plus the thing I'm aggregating to. And it returns a new thing, new aggregate, and then it's the next item in the list. But essentially, for like 10 years or whatever, just recur uh, reducing over a mailbox as messages come in. It's quite a nice little uh, solution. So there's a little server. Trouble is, there's a certain amount of uh, boilerplate here. We've simplified this, you're probably Going to want you might want to have a timeout maybe. What if what if as part of processing you want to send a message back to the to the the person who originally sent you the message? You're going to have to kind of have a little bit of your you're going to end up with a bunch of your processing which is going to be the same for each time you create one of these functions. You end up with boilerplate. So enter OTP, which bizarrely stands for Open Telephony Platform. So they weren't really thinking broad use here, but actually it's a bunch of design patterns and a kind of library kind of together which pretty much come with Erlang. When people talk about Erlang being, you know, uh, very robust and that and being very useful, they're generally talking about Erlang the language, the Beam virtual machine, plus this OTP sort of libraries, which are kind of woven into it. And it's basically got a bunch of helpers for you. It does a bunch of the boilerplate. Because the only actual interesting bit in that previous example, the bit that's actually going to be interesting is what you're doing here. You know, any boilerplate around receiving messages and sending is going to be the same for every little thing you're doing. So... With GenServer, you define modules of functions and you just fill in the blanks you want. So they call it handle call. That's how, that's how do stuff. 
So you write a module with a, a function called handle call on many different functions, remember pattern matching. It takes a message, they also give you who it came from, because it makes sure that when you send, you pass along who you are, and when you receive, you get who it came from, uh, and any state you had from last time. And then we just do whatever we want, and we return a tuple. If we want a reply, send a reply, we just put this little symbol saying, oh, by the way, here's a reply, our reply, and our new state. If we don't want a reply, we just say no reply, and the new state. So we just implement the interesting bit. It does all the looping and the monitoring, and when you send a reply, I should probably check that that guy's still there, and all the boring bits. And then when we start it, rather than just doing a straight up spawn, we call this helper function that's provided by OTP. There's a module called gen server, which is generic server, does all the stuff. You say, by the way, here's my module. Because in the same way that in a functional area, you can pass individual functions into something. If you've got like a group of functions, which you kind of want to pass into something together. So for example, here we've just done one, but there's also, you can, there's kind of like a, you can write a function for what to do when you start the service, what to do when the service ends. So you call this helper uh, library gen server and you start and you give it the name of your module and it will go and look at your module and go, right, well, I'll, have you got an init? No, right, I don't need to do that. Uh, oh, a message came in, I'll call your handle call. And it just does a load of the stuff for you. So you just end up writing this and you've got a funky little server that can run for ages doing stuff. Like I say, you can throw in a bit of pattern matching uh, if you want, because actually you're probably gonna wanna receive different kinds of messages. Here we've got a, a little server it's got two implementations of handle call. The first one only matches when the message is the token, say hello. The second one only matches when it's say goodbye and look what imaginative things they do. They reply with a string of hello or goodbye. And for some reason I've made it count how many times they've replied. Not very useful. So a little bit of pattern matching. And realistically what you tend to do to make it a bit easier for people calling you and knowing what message to send, you generally also put a bunch of, when you're defining a module, you'll probably put a couple of helper methods which are there to help people send the message so they'll just call a function on you and you'll actually send the message for you for them but i know it's there you're adding one onto the state but we've never actually defined what the state is, is yeah in this case first. you'd have an init um uh, function which would set up your original state i should have mentioned the type system for erlang is dynamically typed and strongly typed so you don't put type identifiers on things but if you try and you know add a number and like a boolean it'll blow up so, um, but actually it ends up not mattering as much as you expect it to because you tend to use this pattern where you generally have you pass things generally when you're, you're calling a function you often have this pattern where the thing you pass in is a, is a tuple uh, kind of a bit like this where the, the first element is a uh, some kind of identifier of what does this mean and then it matches on it it's kind of acts a bit like times so Part of the reason, supposedly, for the actor model is it's supposed to be robust, it's supposed to be kind of fault tolerant and that. So what about error handling? Well, if you think about it, life's easy in, in synchronous code. Uh, errors just kind of escalate up the stack. It's nice and straightforward. Here, for example, this is imaginary code. We've got an HTTP error, and it originates in HTTP get. They go up the stack. Oh, well, that came from weather.check. Oh, what called that? Weather widget update, which was called by a weather widget on load. And then we have the general principle that we put exception handling at the level where you can decide what to do about it. And it kind of makes sense because as you go each stack frame you go up, you've kind of got slightly more context of what was actually going on. So it kind of makes it fairly easy where to put the error handling. Um, just be careful you've got exception safe code, you know, leave things a bit wonky. Asynchronous code, it tends to be the same pattern as it work because we end up with something a bit like this. Probably a bit familiar if you've done a bit of node. You end up with some error and it's a very short call stack and then pretty quick we're into next tick because there's just something scheduling little bits of code and they're kind of detached from um, uh, what the original intent was. So you can't just use bubbling up the stack. So you end up with maybe going to do callbacks or make some promises. Well, the Erlang approach is, is to use this, this idea of processes and relations between them to let errors propagate to another process. And we'll have processes, other processes which deal with it, other actors. So for that to make sense, we need to understand a little bit about how processes can be related. So in the example we've seen up to now, we just had a process and it talked to another one. There's no relationship between them. If one of them dies, it dies and you don't really get told about it. If you've sent it a message and you've got a timeout waiting for a reply, then you might realize, hello, nobody's there. You can also link two processes. So we saw that spawn function. There's also another variant, spawn link, 
which is kind of blocking. I'll make sure that one's set up. It's okay. And if either of these two die, the other one will block. Um, so when one pops, the other one pops. And run this together. There's something very similar, which is monitored pro uh, processes, where you can say, I want to monitor this process. It's basically just one way. So you get told if it dies, it doesn't get told if you die. Fair enough. But okay, great. So now everything falls over in a heap because we've linked everything together. Still not that useful. Enter OTP again with some helpful things. Because what you can do when that little message, uh, when something dies, actually a message is sent under the, under the hood to say, by the way, it's dead. And because you don't handle that, you die. But you can choose to capture that and you can go, ah, I'm going to act on this, the fact that it's died, I'm going to do something. But again, we end up with all kind of boilerplate because, you know, error handle, there's only so many variations, generally speaking. So OTP comes in and they've got this idea of a supervisor, which does all the, a bunch of boilerplate. And you just tell it what kind of, super, what kind of error handling strategy you want. So um, the most common one is just replace things when they die. So we've got a process, it pops, supervisor gets told, traps it, doesn't die itself and just replaces it, spools up a new one. Basically, turn it off and on again. It's what we end up doing anyway. Oh, the ghost of, well, I'll just give it a, you know, it's the old rerun to victory, encoded in code. If you think about it, this is genius. They've made a language where turning things off and on again is actually built into the language. You just, and you can just specify, like, the, the, you know, how much to turn off and on again. And if that doesn't work, we'll turn on off a bit more. That's surprising. It seems to work. So, generally speaking, you've got a supervisor, which you've shaded in cunningly. It's talking, it's got a, a worker at supervising and, and you just tell the supervisor, make me a worker, it makes it and monitors it and you need to communicate with it to do stuff. If it screws up, you'll get a new one. Um, there's other strategies, for example, there's, the, there's one called uh, One For All, where you've got a couple of things being supervised by the same thing, and you might go, well, you know what, if one of these dies, the whole thing's kind of balked up. We actually, you know, we need to start these things back up in order. You know, maybe these things have got direct references to each other, and, you know, if one of them's dead, there's no point just replacing that. So one dies, and they all get told to. They all get wiped out by the supervisor. Time to clear up. We've got to start things afresh. So there's different strategies here, and you can mix and match these things, um, and everything's back to normal again. So realistically, I came up with a bit of an example here. Here we've got, I've tried to go with this widget example. So we've got a top-level widget supervisor. It does straightforward um, uh, replacing kind of stuff. And what does it manage? It's got a widget. And it's got another supervisor, HTTP supervisor, which monitors an HTTP fetcher. It's all a bit contrived. But this supervisor has been given a strategy which says count how many times that one fails in a certain amount of time. If it's failing really frequently, frequently, don't restart it, just die yourself. So we can imagine here, the HTTP fetcher, it's got some transient error, pop, it gets replaced, everything's good again. It's got something more fundamental where the state's kind of got screwed up. Pop, 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 it keeps popping. Eventually this one's going to give up and pop. And maybe our widget supervisor is one for all and goes, you know what, probably maybe the widget's just sending you crap. So it rips them both down. So you can kind of have it escalate. Basically, you're turning on and off bigger chunks of the system. So that's kind of uh, how you can combine these things together. So the bit you've all been looking forward to, Prolog X Syntax, the smartest choice of all. Yeah, they liked Prolog. That's a personal choice. Um, you can get your eye into it. You, you can, I know Andy's kind of, how to play around with Erlang, he says you, you get used to it. Uh, it's a bit unusual if you're coming from other languages. It's also, as well as being a bit different, it's also a bit of a pain in the butt. You know, just these lines end with a dot, this one ends with a comma, this one ends up with a semicolon. Depending on the context, it's not so easy to copy paste code around without it whining at you. So, okay, and there's a few other little niggles as well. The tooling's really powerful, but okay, you're gonna be in for a bit of a long ride getting your first app up and running. It's kind of a little bit uh, magic spells, a bit arcane. There's a lot of boilerplate involved, even though OTP strips back a lot of stuff for you. There's still a lot of guff you have to do, and a bit repetitive. It's just kind of difficult to get up and running. Now, if this had been an academic language, maybe Lisp or something coming from purely from academia, the appropriate response would have been long articles written in scientific journals of merit, be how you debate the pros and cons of it. But since this thing was uh, known to much of the world by a quirky little video, on YouTube, the only sensible way to critique it... Hello. Hello, Joe. Hello, Mike. Question. Does anyone care about the differences between declarative and imperative languages anymore? Don't be silly. The declarative-imperative debate is always a crowd pleaser. From what I can tell, kids these days are going with what's cool, like no JS and Ruby on Rails. Let's ask Robert. 
Hello, Robert. Hello, Mike. Joe's back to talking about declarative languages again. I just think Erlang's got a problem. When its spokesman is an old funny dummy. Hey, Joe. Fight me. Robert, what do you think? Erlang's the shitter. But I can't blame kids for picking something a little less crusty. Erlang's image is stuck in the 1980s. It's the bananarama of languages. <laughs> okay. Tell you what. <coughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this video is worth what watch the original one through first that's 10 minutes and then this is absolutely hilarious I've just taken a clip but they make a reasonable point enter Elixir um, so a slightly more uh, guy who had a similar feeling about things but he had a slightly more pragmatic approach he's one of the guys who's a, a core uh, Rails team contributor and he was constantly fixing bugs with Ruby uh, on Rails, which was supposed to be thread safe from like version eight years ago or whatever, and he was constantly fixing all the issues with it. He started looking around for other languages, and to put it in his own words, um, when this loads, come on. And that was when I had the idea of, okay, let's, so let me try to find my own language that is going to use this wonderful virtual machine, but bring constructs and bring tooling that I saw everywhere. And that was kind of how Elixir was born. So, this guy, Jose Villin, he started on his own little project, tore it up a few times, and he basically built a new front end to the language. Now, semantically, very, very, very similar to Erlang, because, as like I say, the VM is not kind of really general purpose. But syntactically, uh, it's much nicer. It's got a Ruby esque syntax. In fact, you've already been seeing it all the way through the talk, because the pseudocode we were looking at was actually Elixir. So, pick with here. Um, but don't be fooled by this. It is not. It's very much not Ruby. It looks a bit like Ruby, but the semantics are entirely Erlang. It's got modern tooling. Um, there's a tool called Mix, uh, which is a bit like npm. Uh, it's a bit like npm plus Yeoman rolled into one. You type Mix new, it creates you a uh, project with all the bits in the right place for it to compile as an OTP application. It's even got, but it's also got a file in there where you list your dependencies. It's even got a git ignore file set up ready to go for you, so you can do a git check in straight off the bat. Uh, and you're up and running. It creates a unit test sort of uh, directory for you with an example test in it, and you can get cracking. You want to add a dependency, you add it to the, the mix file, and you type mix dependencies get, or depths get, and it goes and downloads them, and it understands, oh, okay, GitHub, right, I got this, and goes and fetches it. Modern tooling, makes it a lot easier. Um, it's also got the shell we use, that was uh, IX, which is Elixir Interactive Shell. Do all kinds of cool stuff with that. Um, and also, mm, it's more of a preference thing. It's got macros, but they're apparently the term is hygienic. So they're not just there magically in the background. You have to explicitly say, in this in this scope, we're going to use these macros, and you can pull in a macro module. Now it's allowed to do things. Outside of that, it's not allowed to do anything. Uh, and they use quite sparingly. Um, so for example, in if you bring in the X unit macros, you can do things like assert X greater than six. Now, if this wasn't a macro, this would just evaluate and get passed into a cert, and the answer would just be true or false. So you'd get an answer like true or false in your test output. Because it's a macro, it can actually inspect this at uh, compile time. It actually takes the, it gets the AST for your code and can do rewrites at compile time. And it can actually, you'll get this assertion with greater than failed. Code was x greater than 6, the left hand side was 5, the right hand side was 6. They also, there's a module, a library you can pull in which essentially gives you link but they didn't have to rip up the compiler and build it into the language because of the macros. If you bring in the like use ecto, then it, within the scope where you've pulled in the use, you can basically do link. You know, so it lets you kind of do some funky stuff. Actually, under the hood, a bunch of the language is written using macros, um, but obviously they're special ones that are allowed to run because that's how the like the if keyword is done with a macro. Um, so to wrap up, should you use them? So Erlang Elixir. Personal projects? Yeah, go for it. Uh, expand your mind. The reason I, I kind of got into this, I've been meaning for years to learn Erlang because it seemed like a great would expand my brain in two directions at once because you've got the whole functionalness, which seemed like it might be worth a try, plus the whole concurrency model. So yeah, go for it. Um, nice thing is you've got a, there's a load of libraries in that you can pull in um, because there's, there's a, a package manager which is now being picked up by Erlang projects as well. Uh, Jose created it, but so a bunch of existing Erlang libraries are being repackaged up in a way that's easy to pull in and load up into this package manager, so you can just pull them down. So you've got all those libraries, all that robust runtime, uh, and then you've got a nice sort of modern layer on top. Real projects? Uh, maybe. Um, pros, pros and cons, it's different. Um, 
takes a little bit of a while to start thinking about how to structure things as actors. But it is quite powerful as well. I mean, it's not magic. You know, it doesn't make everything suddenly nine nines of uptime without actually having to think about. You still have to make sort of policy choices about, well, what happens when that goes away? What do I want to happen? But it's got the, the, the tooling built in. There are a few developers around uh, for it. Um, you can speak to Al Brown about that. He's managed a, an Erlang project in the past, and they had a little bit of difficulty finding good developers. Uh, but they are growing in number. Um, the problem is less niche. Elixir makes it an easier on-ramp. People are coming in. Plus, actually, despite being very different, the kind of patterns it uses are the kind of things which you sort of might fall into if you're familiar with the problem space. So, for example, the 10 guys who built uh, WhatsApp, um, which incidentally, WhatsApp, at one point, when they had less servers, oh, it's still true now, I think they've exceeded it, they can have 2 million concurrent connections serviced by a single box. Quite a beefy one, like 90-odd uh, gig of RAM, but it's got 2 million connections, so that's at least 2 million processes running, just for the connections, plus it's kind of doing stuff with them, so it's... They do a lot of messaging at WhatsApp. They've got some good presentations. But those guys hadn't done Erlang before, but they had dealt with scaling. And so they were used to the kind of trade-offs and problems. Then when they came to Erlang, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, this makes sense. This is what we wanted. Uh, and it's interesting as well. There's a, there's a good article where a chap critiques um, the code that's used for the Mars Curiosity rover, rover. Written in C, NASA uses C. But actually, if you look at their guidelines of their system design, it's all separate processes okay. which aren't allowed to share anything. They use a message bus to communicate, and there's kind of a bunch of, you know, comparisons. Um, so, you know, obviously you can get by without it, but it's more work. NASA have quite a rigorous process. Um, but, you know, if you brought those people onto Earl and they'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm familiar here. So, um, and that's the end. So, uh, discuss. A lot of stuff in there. Right back to the beginning, you used the term soft real, soft real yeah. time. I wasn't quite sure what the softy part of that was. I think it's because if you want sort of definitions of really hard real time, generally speaking, you're going to end up with a system where there's no dynamic memory allocation. There's a really fixed amount of time before you can guarantee that, you know, your calls will be handled and, um, uh, and will be serviced. Any interrupts will be serviced within this amount of time. You know, all the memory is allocated up front, like if you look at NASA's code and guidance and stuff. Um, this is used for soft real-time in that you can't have that really tight guarantee, but actually um, there's, it's pretty consistent how quickly every process will get um, serviced, kind of to dimension actually. If you compare to, like in Node for example, uh, you've got one thread of uh, users kind of application code. If you do something big and slow, nobody else gets processed for a while. Even in like .NET, so using tasks, which I think are awesome. Uh, those tasks are being scheduled on a pool of threads. And if they all start doing something slow, the other tasks don't get a play sort of very quickly. Now, one of the reasons, or one of the advantages, of the fact that uh, Erlang's got its own VM, it actually counts every process that's got something to do. So any process which is not sat waiting on a mailbox with nothing happening, gets in a list of processes with something to do. They get spread out over the cores. Um, and they get, I think they get a certain amount of operations before they're turfed out. I think it's 2,000. They call them reductions. And they've, that's instrumented right the way down. So even processing a regex, you might be interrupted like two or three times through that process. A lot of languages, the interrupt can only happen in between system calls because it's actually running on the method. Whereas Erlang can go, right, you've had a little go, right, and it should shovel you off. So it, even if you're doing something really slow on a bunch of the processes, they'll all still get their, their kind of time in the sun. So you actually get pretty good... If you want low latency, it tends to work out pretty well. Um, so that maybe answers that. Any other discussion? Uh, you mentioned a few clients that were using it. Um, Call of Duty? Or, or they... I think they use it for like a back end, like a, one of their game servers, which manages like the presence and the messaging and stuff between as people connect to like the online, um, whatever you call it, lobby? Is that the term? I'm not a gamer. Whatever. It's so it's used for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's on like 1.1 1. 1 or something. But it's um, the thing is, it's because it's it's kind of a, a relatively thin layer on top of something which is kind of 30 years old. Um, by all accounts, it seems to be pretty robust, um, and they're sitting there and letting it stabilize. It. You know, I was playing around with it from about beta 13 or whatever, and there's quite a community of people kind of beating on it, and it's it seems seems pretty robust. I guess that's largely because they're getting a free ride to a lot of things. You compare that to like Go, we've had to write everything from the ground up. 
Um, Do you know any, any, any serious like uh, companies which eventually are using Elixir? Elixir, there's a there's a there's a bunch of companies listed on there. There's like a company that kind of backs it. There's a bunch of companies they list that are sort of experimenting with it. Uh, I think I Matt mentioned on Slack. I think that some Chapino from the BBC uh, is moved to uh, Sky. And they've got a project I'm going with it, but uh, yeah, I'll be honest with you. It is a newish, it is a new language. There is the potential for it having some problem in it, but as I say, since most of the heavy lifting is pretty well bedded in, um, but yeah, there isn't a massive list of like you know, here's IBM and NASA and you know, using Elixir. Um, a lot of a lot of people are kind of playing with it. So presumably nobody's using it here for production though. You would have mentioned it. But no, yeah, I've. Have you had any ideas for any applications? Yeah, Dave and I have been amazing. spunking around in mastery time, Dave Wong, um, building like some kind of statusy monetary type thing, which is kind of a good fit for because you've got a bunch of things you want to watch kind of thing. And so we're sort of doing it as a, you know, let's solve, a, let's build a little tool, which is kind of useful um, for the team, but it's not critical. We can, you know, shove it in a Docker container on like Pinslurg Docker or whatever, have it monitor things. And it's, you know, we're doing it in mastery time as a bit of a experiment really, but... Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not proposing, hey, let's rewrite all the things. Um, because, you know, most of the time there's more than just language choice, probably isn't your main uh, sl thing slowing you down on whatever thing you're on. But, you know. That's not that. segues nicely into this, uh, tomorrow afternoon of Books Out Worlds, and the idea is people can have a bit of a play around. Yeah, I'll little. probably be in there poking around on my little app. Um, if people want to come around and kind of don't want to be completely on their own getting started kind of thing, you know, you can come tap me on the shoulder. I haven't got an idea of like a catter or something, but on the Elixir website, there's a great tutorial actually where they go through building a key value sort of store thing, which is actually a pretty good tutorial for kind of introducing you to a bunch of bits. Uh, but if you get stuck, I'll be there. So do my own little bit. Of is there any sorts of prep people need to do for set up? Uh, that's a good shout. Two yeah. hours, people could easily yeah, 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 true. Um, install Elixir. Uh, there's instructions on their website. You can get a Docker container if you want to do it that way, um, but obviously that you know you want to mount in some directories and uh, it's a bit more sort of work in some ways. You can, but yeah, just follow the tutorial to in install it. Um, have a look through the docs if you want. You're welcome to join me. I'll be doing it anyway, sort of thing. So I thought I'd kind of make it a bit public and tag along if you want. That's all. <laughs>